So in the previous chapter, chapter three, we talked about linear regression and probably I should click this. So I'm not jumping between these. So in the lin linear regression, the idea is we have the predictors, we have the observations and the each of those are um, quantitative, meaning that they are numbers, the numbers correlate the way numbers correlate with, the, with each other. In this chapter, we want to talk about the uh, classification from which is usable when we are not dealing with numbers. Essentially, we have the case that, uh, for example, the question is, we are in an emergency room, there are a set of symptoms, um, AKA observations, and then we want to associate those observations, those symptoms to some sort of <clears throat> medical condition. And we want to categorize them into one of the three uh, conditions. Um, the other case that the book talks about it is the bank in, in the banking services. Uh, we want to see a transaction. We, we want to go through the transactions for each client, and we want to see if there is any any of those are fraudulent or not. So the answer is yes or no. There is like zero and one correlation. Or the the third case that the authors are talking about is about uh, DNA sequencing data, especially if you are uh, like me in the world of bioengineering, biogenetics, biogenet and it's stuff like that, you have DNA mutations. You want to see if those mutations are correlated to specific disease or not. So the answer is yes or no. Um, and we want to see if that mutation, that change in the data set is causing any mm, diseases or not. Is it del uh, deleterious or not? So um, this is kind of like the concept that the book starts off of those. And there are some techniques to handle this kind of situations. Uh, they are most, the most uh, common known, known ones are logistic regression, linear discriminant analysis, quadratic discriminant analysis, naive Bayes, and k-nearest neighborhood. And again, these are the examples that we talked about in the emergency room, the uh, clients, patients. Uh, are coming into the emergency room uh, with a set of symptoms. We want to detect uh, which kind of, which type they are. Uh, this is again, fraudulency issues. And we want to look at the IP address, transaction history, the values, the numbers, the locations, et cetera. And DNA sequencing the same. One of the examples, the first example that uh, we talk about here is the fact that uh, clients, they have a credit card balance that you can see in figure 4.1, the left panel, uh, the credit card balance is uh, plotted on the x-axis and the income level is on the right, the, the vertical axis. Uh, blue ones are the ones that did, uh, did not default and the brown plus markers are showing that the, those, of, those people who, are, uh, who had defaulted on their debt. Um, the fact is only th less than 3% or 4% of people are defaulting on their debt, but uh, for the sake of argument and demonstration here, they kind of uh, tip the balance between the two data. So the ones who did default are showing up better and uh, with, with respect to the rest of the people, the rest of the population, which is blue. So you could categorize them into two ways using the balance that they have and see if balance has any correlation with the default. And as you can see, like hum uh, we as humans, we can argue that, oh, those who had higher balance, they had a higher chance of uh, defaulting. Uh, but when we look at the income, they are pretty much at the same level when we look at the plots on the right-hand side. So, the way we are talking about the default is a binary um, situation. And it exactly fits into the um, problem of classi classification. And we want to look at how to deal with it because linear regressions are, are not able to handle this. Essentially the next section, the next chapter, it's talking about why linear reg regression is not working, um, wouldn't work. For the case of people in the emergency room, those who are uh, coming into the emergency room, remember we wanted to put them into three categories based off, off of their symptoms. 
And if we want to use linear uh, regression, we have to assign numbers to those outcomes. So we could say uh, y equals to one if, there's, if the symptoms match stroke, equals to two if they are, uh, if they are ellipt, uh, epileptic seizure, and if it, it's equals to three if they have overdose, if, if they have drug, any sort of drug overdose. Um, the argument that, uh, that is presented here is there is no linear correlation between those three diseases, those, those three conditions and the numbers that we are assigning to them. So if we think about the world of linear regression, one to two, there is like the number is doubled, but epileptic seizure is not two strokes. Drug overdose is not three strokes. And the difference between uh, drug overdose and uh, a stroke is not epileptic seizure. So uh, we see that one, two, three assignment to these uh, events, to these predictions is not gonna work for us. Um, I'm just looking at my notes. So uh, essentially the book is arguing that it's not really easy to come up with a universal rule that says, if we have this condition, then you have to go to linear regression or you have to go to classification. Essentially, you need to look at the gap between the data that you have, gap between the stages and numbers or, or cases, mm -hmm. situations that you have here. And you, look at, you need to look at the natural ordering if there is anything occurring. So if instead of having stroke, epileptic seizure, seizure and drug overdose, we had one disease and we would say, um, if they had this set of symptoms, we had a, a mild level. Then we uh, at this level, we would have moderate and then at, uh, at, and, and at another level of symptoms, we would have a severe case. If we had that kind of case, we could argue that linear regression would work. However, that's not the case for, for most of our classification problems. As you can see, it's stroke, epileptic seizure, they are not one-to-one. -one. It's not two strokes. If I get two strokes, I get two <laughs> epileptic seizure for any cases. Um, however, there is one way around it. If we had, instead of having three symptoms, we wanted to see uh, if the patients are a candidate for stroke or not. In this kind of situation that we have yes or no, default of the death or no, um, we could, there, there is a way around it when we have this kind of binary situation using dummy variables. Um, and then you can, or, uh, like the book uh, explains how you could come up with a linear regression model and then uh, for the linear regression, if the prediction is more than 50%, you, you could call it a, a prime candidate for, for stroke, and if it's less than 50%, you could call it nothing. No, it's not, it's not gonna be a candidate for stroke. Mm. And as a summary, they say there are uh, at least two reasons not to, perform classific um, not to perform classification using a regression method. The first one is regression methods cannot uh, accommodate a quant qualitative response with more than two classes, more than zero and one. And the second case is a regression method will not provide meaning, meaningful estimate for the uh, expression that we have here, uh, prediction of y given x, even when we have two, two classes. And partial estimates can fall outside of zero and one. Um, I commented on this on um, the GitHub, but let me show my screen in a different way. Mm. Sorry, I'm switching. The... I think that's uh, some figure, right? The binary one. Uh, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So when, uh, as you can see here, so in the case that we have binary situation, the left-hand side, you can see the result of linear regression. As you can see, the blue line is the prediction the outcome of the model. And uh, I circled the bottom uh, left. Uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, can you? Yes. Okay, yes, so, so, the, so uh, the blue line is a linear regression, right? 
So yeah, the yeah, left yeah. panel, yeah, exactly. So the left panel is the blue line is showing the prediction, uh, the outcome of the prediction model for re linear regression. The right panel is showing that with the same data, if we run it through the logistic regression, this is the type of the blue line shows the type of result, the type of prediction that we get. So on the, if we uh, apply the linear regression to inappropriate uh, set of problems, it is possible that we get the probability less than zero or prob probability more than one. Uh, if we want to think about different cases, for example, the, this is uh, the plot is showing the case of default versus balance. People are, uh, are either defaulting or not. It's not, I'm defaulting 10% more or I'm not defaulting 10% less or 10% more, more. It doesn't make sense. Or in the case of stroke, no stroke, I'm either candidate for stroke or no stroke. I cannot do like 30% stroke. It's kind of funny and it, it's not meaningful <laughs> um, if you wanna think about it. So with that, essentially the um, authors are introducing us to the rest of the concept about the logistic regression. Uh, they are introducing the concept of probability. Uh, for example, for the case of um, default, we want to see when we, whenever we have default given an, a balance rate. Uh, if we want to uh, dive into the math, essentially probable, uh, I have a note on the right hand side, I don't know if you, it is clear, uh, but it's essentially probability of occurring A given B value is probability of A and B divided by probability of B. Um, and essentially we can uh, abbreviate the probability of default equals to yes, given the balance with the, with the small b and a small p and balance that you can see on the right hand side. And I guess that's, that gives us a good step rate to go to this screen. Sorry, I'm just switching screen. Okay, so here we want to look at the probability uh, starting from the linear regression on the top uh, on the top line, we start with a familiar concept from the linear regression. We said that probability of occurring X is equals to a linear uh, equation, essentially. Assuming that we have the observation X, uh, we have beta zero and then beta one as the coefficients that helps us to, to find out the probability of occurrence of a binary X. The logistic regression equation is a little Bit different. It is using the logistic function that you can see in the second line. And it's essentially e to the power of what we had for the linear regression divided by one plus the same thing that we had in, in the denominator. Um, so the main problem we have is to find beta zero and beta one in the logistic regression, right? So we have the function, we need to find beta zero and beta one essentially given the data that we have, we need to find the best beta zero and beta one. So this function, this P of X in the second line fits our data the best. And we do the fitting using the maximum likelihood uh, function um, that we're gonna describe a little bit later. Essentially this P of X gives us the values the, or odds um, between zero and positive infinity. Um, however, uh, we can play around with it, take a log from both sides of the equation, play around with it and uh, show that log of Px over one minus of P of X is equals to the same familiar linear regression equation. So this, uh, this is what we call log odds or log it. And this is easier to understand. This is easier to handle. Remember the logistic function that we get here, sorry, the, um, yeah, the log the function that we get here is gonna give us that S curve that I, that I showed in the previous, um, right, uh, the previous picture with the like S shape, the blue line on the right panel. 
um, and what is next? Oh, okay. So given that we to find the beta values, we use the maximum likelihood uh, function. Essentially, the function you, you see it here. There is one extra equals this ex equal sign is uh, extra here, but uh, you get the point. It's the mul um, multiplication of possibilities, possibilities of the event happening and times the possibility of the events not happening at the same time. And we want to um, find the estimates for beta zero and beta one here in such a way that this L function, this whole function becomes maximum um, for that prediction. If we uh, meet that criteria, we can be sure that this log it uh, estimation that we came up with has a good fit, good level of fit with the data that we have. Um, okay, before running to this, I want to show you an example of what happened. So essentially the book came up with an example. Um, it's gonna show up here in this table. So they looked at the um, default example, that default example, and they did the um, uh, <laughs> classification, the logit regression, uh, sorry, the classification problem around the balance and they found out that the beta zero for that is gonna be best estimated with minus 10.6513 and beta one is gonna be equals to point, 0 0.0055. And for each of these uh, uh, observations that we have here, we have only balance. We want to look at the uh, correlation between default and balance. We have a p-value, disease statistics and a uh, a p-value, which is exactly the same as the t-test that we ha previously had in the basic statistics between groups. So this 0 .0, uh, 0 0.0055 means that if we change the balance by one unit, this is the amount that the probability of default, the log probability of default, the log it, will change. This is how much it will change. And if we go down, there is an example of calculation here. Sorry if it's too large. So you can see beta zero and beta one. So instead of one, they went with 1000. So the probability of X changing, if they have $1,000 debt, this is how it's being calculated. Beta zero and beta one is coming from the classification table that we showed earlier. And now the result is simply by doing the math, putting these in, and this is the probability that we get. The interesting part is when we move to, sorry, um, the case that we have students, same, uh, same problem, same data, instead of looking at the default versus balance level, default versus student level. You can see the values are changing, intercept uh, increases and the beta one value increases significantly. Remember the previous number was uh, 0.0055, now it's 0.4, which is significantly more. Now, if I want to do the calculation, um, going back a little bit, sorry, I'm going back and forth. Uh, con continuously. So with the $1,000 balance, we came up with uh, about 0.5% chance of uh, defaulting. Now this example, the second line, you can see that here, if the debt increases to $2,000, $2, the probability increases from under 1% to 58%. So and as you can see, there is a significant jump and it's obvious that we are going up of a steep curve compared to the linear regression model that we had before. Now, for the same case, if we have $1,000 balance, 
these two equations. So the top one, it's saying that uh, probability of defaulting given we, we are dealing with, with a student if it had $1,000 debt. So in this model, they just instead of 1,000, they did it as one. So you can see the probability if the person is a student is 0.04, but if the, for the same amount of debt, now instead of one, student was yes, right? Student is now no, so it's changing to zero, x, the value for x, is changing to zero. So probability of defaulting changes from 0.04 to 0 0.0, almost 0.29 or 0.03. So that's how it's changing with different parameters. So you can see that for each of these categorical um, functions, the way we are, the, the way the model is behaving is a little bit different. So that's one of the things that we need to start to think about and <clears throat> be careful when we are dealing with this classification problem and how many uh, samples we have. <coughs> so <coughs> when we go to the multiple logistic regression, essentially we are dealing with this kind of situation. Instead of having one X, now we have X1, X2, all the way to XP, whatever number of events, num uh, observations we have. Now, when we look at the log it, it's gonna be equals to this linear uh, correlation and the actual probability distribution will be equals to this complex uh, equation that you see here, which is uh, e to the power of the linear correlation between uh, x's plus one over, um, there is an e missing here also. Same thing in the nominator should go to the denominator one plus nominator. You can imagine how it looks like. So if we look at the data that we had for the, um, for, for the credit card, the debt and default and the balance and studenthood relationship, you can see for the ones who are not student, we have the blue line in the left panel. For the ones who are uh, student, you can see the brown or orange, I don't know, what, what I should call it. You can see this line here. The interesting observation is um, this. If we uh, look at, so you can see the graphical representation. Let me show you the table values for the beta. So in table 4.3, you can see the intercept beta zero is minus 10 point something. The uh, first observation is balance. Second observation is the income. Third ob observation observation is uh, being student or not. So you can see beta one and beta two are relatively small. However, studenthood is this time is negative 0.6. Previously it was 0.04. So this should trigger some question. Oh, how is it possible that we have this kind, kind of situation when we had studenthood alone, we had point of, uh, point 0.4 positive, and it was significantly positive. Now it's negative point 0.6, and it's significantly negative. Um, the way the book is addressing this kind of um, confusion or question is the correlation between the factors are important. So the negative coefficient for a student in, uh, in the multiple logistic regression indicates that for a fixed value of balance and income, student is less likelihood to, oops, sorry, is less likelihood to default than a non-student. However, students overall are carrying more debt. So if we go to the figure, the uh, right-hand panel shows that explanation uh, very obviously. So you can see on the uh, right panel, students, if the, uh, students, if the status of student is yes, we, we observe more debt. However, for the same amount of balance for the dashed red line here, for dashed red line, for the same amount of balance, students are less likely, who, le less likely to default on their debt. So I hope it clarifies um, the problem or the situation that we are dealing with.
And the dashed brown and uh, blue lines on the right panel are showing essentially the mean, uh, the mean balance for students and non-students when they are defaulting. So you, say, you see on average, uh, students are defaulting with higher balance and higher chance, but at the same level, again, going back to that, at the same level of uh, balance, students are less likely to default. Okay, switching back to the notes. Sorry, I'm jumping between the cases. So given that essentially, um, there are also more, more calculations in the book, so I'm not uh, going over those. Essentially, they give, gave an example of 40K income, uh, $1,500 of credit card balance, and they compared the, the actual number for possibility of default uh, for student and non-student, which was doubled. Essentially, the student was 0.05 and non-student was 0.1. Equations four, eight, and four, nine are showing the calculation for that. So the other uh, case uh, is essentially multinomial logistic regression is addressing the cases that we have more than two classes, meaning that we, we have more than yes or no. We have more than defaulting yes or no. We have more than causing disease, not causing disease. We have something like the first example that we had for the emergency room where we had, um, what was that? Stroke, epileptic seizure and uh, drug overdose. So when we have more than two classes, essentially we are referring back to, uh, referring to uh, multinomial uh, logistic regression and we use the, uh, the equations that we have there. And the logit correlation there is a little bit more complex and we, essentially have to um, use more kind of complex set of equations. And then calculate the error rate off of that. The way we go around it in the coding uh, environment is using the softmax code. And that will treat all the K classes symmetrically and assume that for all of the classes, um, we have kind of like the same amount of the same baseline. So in the normal way, what we would do, we, uh, we would select one class, as, uh, going back to the example of emergency, we say, okay, let's assume the baseline is a stroke. Now we have a kind of like K equals to two, and we wanna look at epileptic seizure or no epileptic seizure, for example. So that's one set. Then the other set, the other baseline would be epileptic seizure. Now we want to look at stroke, no stroke. We want to look at drug overdose, no drug overdose. Then the third case is drug overdose as the baseline. Now we want to look at stroke, no stroke, epileptic seizure, no epileptic, epileptic seizure. So that creates like a bunch of models that we need to develop. Instead of doing that, we assume that the baseline for all of them are the same in the soft max. And we estimate all the coefficients for all classes rather than estimating for each individual classes and go one after another and doing the calculation. And then at the end, finding out, oh, what is the beta value for this when we have this kind of case versus the beta value for that when we have the other case as the baseline. And with that, we can go to the generative uh, models for classification. Essentially, uh, we see that logistic regression when we have more than two classes is not the ideal case for us. So the best param parameter, uh, the parameters that we have are mostly unstable. So if the distribution of the predictor X is approximately normal for each of the classes and the sample size is small, then it is better to go to the logistic regression. But when we have more than two classes, we have uh, not normal distribution. Uh, it could be Bayesian or any other distribution, but anything other than normal, and we have large size, it's better to move away from logistic regression and go to the gener uh, generative models for classification. 
And for the generative model, models, we use uh, common, a common no notation. So imagine we have K classes, K response classes, and probability of prior pro probability of each of those classes is shown with pi K. Um, be careful, this is not pi 3.14, it's pi as pro prior probability. Um, I don't know if uh, we have a clear understanding of prior versus posterior uh, probability, but if you are not familiar, there is a good video by three blue, one brown. It's talking about Bayes uh, theorem and geometric uh, changes. And also there is another one, given that we, we went through the pandemic, there is a medical test paradox. Essentially, it will show it will show you that we ha we can have a uh, probability for, for example, C shows cancer, and we have a probability for occurrence of a cancer. This is what you hear in the news, like there is 5% of the population uh, uh, vulnerable to prostate cancer, for example. The question is whether when we do go through the test, when we get positive or negative value for the test, how accurate is that? Is every single positive test means that we have the disease or every single negative test, it means that we don't have the disease. With COVID, I guess we all know the, the situation very well now. Um, positive doesn't necessarily mean you have COVID for 100% uh, accuracy and negative doesn't mean that you don't have it. You could be asymptomatic, you could show negative and you could have disease. So not going deep into that, I would suggest to observe these two videos from Three Blue, One Brown. He's so fun uh, explaining um, this. Yeah, do you ahead. want to post the URL of the video in the chat so that we can watch it? Oh, good idea. Time. Yes. So uh, this, is, this, this is the first video. And here's the second video. And this is a, another one that I found online. It's explaining different situations very well. Um, the fun part about these tests is the prior uh, probability doesn't have any biases. It's just looking at the facts. And for example, 1% of the population is prone to cancer. 99% is not. However, then when we add the event of testing and getting a positive or negative result for that test. And we apply the posterior probabilities and we calculate those. We find out, oh, the prior probabilities, when we sum them all together, we get one or 100%. For posterior, we don't get that. So that's something that we will cover later in the, um, in the later chapters, when we are later sections, when we are talking about the confusion matrix. We address that kind of confusion later there. But for now, assume that uh, pi of k is the overall prior prob probability for any event, for any observation that is coming from the kth class and can be obtained uh, from random sample population. f of k of x is essentially probability of x happening if the class y is happening. It is the density function, the, the probability distribution of the X density for that observation class. <clears throat> According to the Bayes theorem, essentially we see that uh, probability of Y class, uh, the class is K and event X, X is happening is, is equal, equals to pi, essentially prior pro probability times the distribution divided by all possible uh, combinations in all classes. So we, uh, the denominator is prior probability times distribution function in that specific class divided by the same value summation over all possible classes. So we can uh, change this, this uh, complex notation to small p of, uh, pk of x and call it posterior probability of an observation that belongs to the k class computed from the distribution function in that class. And that helps us to go through um, different conditions. Now we have a probability 
Um, and remember, uh, previously we had the prob we wanted to estimate that probability using uh, log logistic regression. But now we have more than one, more, more than two classes. It's gonna be complex. How do we want to address that is this way. So there are three ways that we want to talk about it here. The first one, the simplest one is linear discriminant, discriminant analysis. The more complex one is quadratic discriminant analysis. And the last one is naive base. So the, for the first one, we have the first example, let's assume we have only one predictor. And we want to classify objects for each. Uh, uh, we want to classify an observation for the class that P of K is great, is the greatest. Uh, meaning that we want to classify each, uh, um, each observation to the most relevant class possible. That's what P of K is the greatest mean. Essentially, we let's say we are in a grocery, uh, grocery, grocery store. We don't want to classify things like we, want, we don't want to put vegetables in the fruit section. It is obvious, right? So we want to kind of uh, make sure the vegetables are in the vegetable section, fruits are in the fruit section, apples are with apples, oranges are with oranges with the, pos with the highest par probability possible. So we assume that for the first simplest way, we assume that the distribution function, the f of k is normal or Gaussian. Uh, you can see the function for Gaussian distribution down here. To make things even more simple and more uh, and easier to follow, we assume that uh, in this uh, distribution, sigma, which is the variance for the distribution in each class in, is equals to other to the rest of them. All of them are equals to sigma. So probability of k is equals to as as a result of this kind of this normal distribution function, the posterior probability will change to something like this, which is the fancier way of, oh, just substitute f from here to the previous equation. You can see the pi times f, it's just fancier, over summation of pi times f again. So in, initially it's intimidated, intimidating, uh, but when you see what's going on, it's easy. So now the question is, okay, I have the probability, we, I want to maximize this function. Um, to, do, to, do the maximiz, uh, to do the maximizing work, uh, some nerds figured out, oh, I don't necessarily need to do this. this. It's gonna be exactly the same as maximizing this equation down here, which is equation 418. It is, we call this the base uh, classifier assigned to, to, the, to the class if, this condition holds true. So now dealing with the um, base classifier uh, equation is way easier, way simpler. So the base decision boundary for any given point, if delta one and delta two are equals, then becomes exactly and at the middle of those. Maybe I assume that we have we we all agree on the uh, convention of. Uh, mu is the average and sigma is the variance of the um, population. So that's why I didn't call, like talked about it. But essentially it's talking about, okay, if I have the, this correlation between events and the averages, then we can say that the maximizing probability of the topic, the top complex equation is the same as maximizing delta K of X. And for two, for for two set of data that we have the distribution like the one on the right uh, on the left panel, we can show that the boundary, the, the decision, the base uh, decision boundary is the thick black dot uh, dashed line in the center. Um, the data that is uh, presented for this example is essentially same uniform data. They are exact. They are same. Um, having the same mean value, the same covariance, uh, essentially uh, the mean value is like 1.25 and negative 1.25. It's shifted uh, from like 
to the positive side and the negative side. That's why the decision boundary falls exactly on zero um, on the left panel. But when they looked at the, instead of the distribution fun function, they looked at the data and they did the calculation for 20 observations that is shown on the right-hand side as a histogram, you can see the actual decision boundary falls a little bit to the left of the ideal situation, which is the solid black line. So we have a 2D, uh, two 1D normal density functions on the left-hand side, and the, on the right is uh, are, two are two sets of 20 observations drawn for each of uh, the two classes and shows as, showed as histogram. And the solid line rep, rep, represents the LDA, linear discriminant analysis decision boundary estimated the, from the training data, which is this. The dashed one is coming from the actual um, distribution function. Remember the difference between what we have on the left and on the right is the left in the, in, the, in reality, most of the time we don't have the one on the left. In reality, what we have is the data on the right-hand side. So the LDA method essentially approximates the linear discriminant analysis uh, for the base classifier by uh, guessing the uh, estimates for pi, for mu, and sigma for each of the classes. Essentially, sigma for each of the classes is the same for all of them. But uh, for the sake of argument, it's easier to say pi, mu, and sigma. We assume that uh, the, the simplest way to do that for the average is to average uh, all of the data for each class, divide by the number of the uh, observations in that, which is the normal averaging. Uh, same thing goes with the sigma, for the sigma for each classes. For each class, instead of going one class at a time, we go through all of them through this equation. As you can see, there are two uh, summations. The first one goes through each class. The second one goes through classes one after another one and combines them all together and shows the sigma for all of them. Essentially, it says whatever data you have, whatever average you have, give it to me and then I will spit out one sigma for all of the data. And then the, we have the pi. Uh, which is the probability. And the simplest way to do the, um, uh, to essentially simulate the observation, to estimate the observation is divide for the, prob the prior probability for each class becomes the number of observations divided by the N total observations, total number of observations. So as a result, the, equation, uh, if we substitute all of these three uh, estimates into equation 418, the result that we get is this delta estimate, delta, delta hat estimate that we have down here. So with that, if we have a more than, so this is a case when we had only one, um, one class. Now, if we have more than one predictor, one, uh, sorry, more than one predictor, um, we change the factors a little bit. So uh, observations come from a multivariate Gaussian distribution with a class, uh, class specific mean vector and a common uh, covariant matrix that is shown here. So on the left-hand side here, you can see if we have like two observations, X1 and X2, both of them are distributed uh, in the Gaussian fa uh, fashion. They are normally distributed. And on the right-hand side, you can see if they are not normally dis distributed. Um, I assume X2 here is normally distributed, but X1 is not. You can see instead of having, if you look at the, um, I guess the yellow ring is the easiest one to track. The yellow ring on the left-hand side is more of a circle, while uh, the one on the right-hand side is like, uh, it's more like an oval shape. Um, elliptical shape. I find this, so the y, the y axis is still measuring the density, right? Because yes. we are looking at where's the density. So I find this very interesting as in, because 
in the left one, the x1 and the x2, the first the two predictors, they are actually not correlated. So we see a, almost a perfect uh, round shape. Whereas for the on the mm -hmm. one on the right, because they have a very high correlation between the variable one and variable two, they have a zero, I think 0 0.7, yeah, 0 0.7 correlation. Mm. So it becomes more like an ellipse, having an ellipse, elliptical kind of base shape. Yeah, yeah, but I'm still like wondering like how it forms the ellipse shapes when they have like high correlation. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's the one I that guess the way really it, understand how it goes. I guess the way it happens is um, if the correlations in, if I remember correctly, if the correlation is one, they would form a line, right? So one unit increase in X is correlate, would it correlate with one unit increase in, so sorry, going back, one unit, unit increase in X1 correlates with one unit increase in X2 and they would fall on the same thing. And then the probability would be kind of, instead of having a dome, it would be one surface. Um, but you mean and then, one as in perfect correlation. Yeah, yeah. If correlation was, instead of 0.7 here, if it was mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. See. Yeah, that then, makes sense. <laughs> Yeah. So if, so if I put it this way, so this would be the line and for correlation uh, equals to one. And then as correlation goes to zero becomes a circle. And then if correlation goes to um, negative one, it would flip to the other way. So negative 0.5, for example, is gonna be here. And then zero again goes to a circle. And then like it, at the end of the day, it's kind of like goes between line, oval, circle, and then oval, like ellipse to the other, and it switches the uh, um, diagonal dimension. And then the vertical uh, height, the red, green, or blue, would show the probability of like these two correlating, and then what is the kind of probability of the event happening. Mm. I think that would be my interpretation. <laughs> I might be wrong. <laughs> I need to yeah. read more on this. Usually, we prefer the uncorrelated one in predictors. And because if you use this method, you need the inverse of the covariance matrix. If you have one is co like related to the other, the variance, the covariance uh, matrix will be not be so like you cannot invert the matrix or like there's no inverse because one line will be the same as the other and then there's no inverse yeah yeah that's yeah. that's true inverse like like if, like if one is all one 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 and the same is just two 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 then there's no inverse for this kind of matrix and that will affect your prediction because you can't use this prediction. That's right, yeah. I'm going to work on that and come, come up with a better <laughs> explanation next week. <laughs> yeah, I think just what this graph is trying to say, like why they make this assumption that they have equal variance, like the previous example, why they come out with this assumption all of them has equal variance is to minimize the case of this, co this co correlation. Because if you have this correlation, then your formula will not work anymore. But of course, in textbook, we always use the most perfect case to yes. make things easier. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So yeah, one of the things is that, yeah, true. Yeah, I think it's just telling you like why you need the variance to be equally weighted so that you can carry on with your formulas. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So do you think um mailing, do you think we should continue for the next five minutes or should we stop here and then yeah, next we week can stop pick here up from here? You... Yeah, we can stop here, like then. We still have 
few more sections to go, right? But I think those are relatively short, if I remember. Yeah, yeah, that's my uh, my sense. Like it, um, this uh, four, five, and four, six. It takes a lot of time, like uh, going through the details um, mm. in the book. Essentially, what it's uh, it's explaining is if we have more than two classes. So previously, you we had uh, one case. It was either this left side of the curve, uh, left side of the decision uh, line, or right hand side of the decision. Uh, here, you can see the same idea instead of. Uh, two distributions, now it's three. That's why you have three lines, three dashed lines, and you have three populations. And now you want to look at how the distribution is happening. Essentially, this, uh, the same equations are following uh, here, a little bit more complex. Um, and you can see how the data, the actual, when we had the data and we uh, came, came up with the decision line as compared to the ideal base, uh, base decision line. It's a little bit tilted, but it has a good estimate of what's, uh, what, it, what, needs, what it needs to be and how the data are classified into di three different categories. And there are some er uh, errors that are possible to happen. And uh, it goes back to the confusion matrix that we described before. So the error rates will usually be uh, lower than the test error rates when we are using the data for training. This is something that uh, the authors dis uh, discuss in different sections of the book, including that at the beginning, they say, we always train our models. However, we don't, and we try to minimize the error with the training set. However, when we see the actual test set, we don't know how it responds. Our ideal situation is the test error, when we introduce the test and when we measure the error rates in the test case, the errors would be low. However, that's not the case. Most of the time what happens is uh, the training error rate decreases linearly. Uh, let me see here. So the error rate decreases. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the right figure, but <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> so as we uh, play around with the mo model, the error rate decreases. However, it's not going to happen necessarily when we are running the actual test. Um, what we try to look at is ROC curve. Um, it's return, sorry, give me a second. Receiver operating characteristics, ROC. And the ideal curve for us is when we the outcome of this curve shows up all the way kind of like to the top left corner. As you can see, there is a curve here and the ideal case is to go all the way here, but that's not gonna happen. And this is the aim that we try to achieve all the time. Um, I think we have to stop here or else yeah. your video will be cut off. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna stop here and um, kind of review this chapter, uh, the beginning of this section next week. Yeah, I think we can talk more about here, this section next week. Okay, yeah, perfect. Thank you everyone. So, if... Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. <laughs> it was really clear. <laughs> so I'll see you all guys next week. I think yeah. same time, yeah. Okay, all right. thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.